my name is Bord, and I know all the jokes about that. <laughs> I think, I hope. I work as a doctor for children, a pediatrician. And they say medicine is an art. It's also a science. And science is very clear. When our children are ill, we need to be on their team. When we're a team, taking blood tests goes easier. Tough treatments become more bearable. So the question is, how does the doctor get on the child's team? And the answer is, when the child trusts the doctor. Let me give you an example. Not too long ago, I went to see a patient of mine at the local hospital just up the street from here, actually. And when I got into the room, I see a little girl on a chair in the corner. She's pale, scared, sweaty, hyperventilating. The room is white, no colors, no windows. It smells sterile. On both sides of her are her parents, just as pale and scared as she is. Over here, we have two nurses, the more robust kind. Can you imagine that? That you don't start easily. One of those with a big set of pliers used to cut costs. You see this girl, she has a cast on her arm. She's in no pain, but she's terrified. Because earlier that day, she'd fallen off her horse and broken that arm pretty badly. So we had operated on it, and uh, it seemed fine. Problem was a nerve is compressed. So we have to do it all over again, starting with taking that cast off. Now, however, she's tired, and it feels like her courage has run out, and she's terrified. So how do we gain a child's trust in this situation? How do we get to be on her team? To do that, there are certain skills you need to have. The two most important ones are you need to see the situation through the eyes of the child, and you have to be curious. So how would that look like? We come in, we see that terrified girl, and we say, what's going on here? They're going to take that off. Take it off. It looks brand new. How are they going to do that? With those, with those enormous pliers? Wow, oh, how are we going to help with that? I don't know. That's OK, because I don't know either yet. We'll find out together. And since you control how you think and feel and act, I wonder how you're going to keep yourself comfortable and in control while you make your arm ready to have that cast removed. You see what's going on here? When we come in, she's up here at an intensity level. And instead of trying to calm her down, saying it's nothing to worry about, it'll be OK, it won't hurt, you're a big girl, instead of that, we join her level of intensity, we see it through her eyes, and then we calm down together. And while you make yourself ready to have that cast removed, where do you think you'll be more comfortable? On mom's lap or on dad's? On dad's you sure know how to make the right choice for you. And while you make yourself ready, what do you like to play with in your mind's imagination? A kite, helium balloons, or something else? Helium balloons, she said. So now we've sort of calmed down together. We're on a team. Problem with that is that this is a quite intense an acute situation. We can't run into every consultation room screaming like that. I hope you see that. So how would this look like in a more normal consultation that we have every day at the hospital? Let's look at another example. A little boy is six years old, missing a tooth, and he's been sick for three, four days. Fever and a cough. Nothing life-threatening, but enough to anxiety to creep up on his mother doesn't eat, hardly drinks, wakes up in the middle of the night sweaty. A hundred things go through a mother's 
head when kids are ill? Has she done something wrong? Does he need some medication? Is she overreacting? Or is she overlooking something serious? When our kids are ill, our parental minds are full of doubts about ourselves. So what can we do to get on his team? They decided to go to the doctor, and now they're waiting at the doctor's uh, in, the, in the waiting zone. And when the doctor comes out, he sees a little boy, pale, holding his teddy bear, staring at his shoes, and his anxious mom. So the doctor comes out, sees that, and says, I'm looking for Dennis. Yeah, that's us, mom will say. And that we take the liberty to ignore, hoping she'll forgive us. That doesn't sound like someone named Dennis. I'm looking for Dennis. And when he looks up, I can say, hi, I'm bored. I'm your doctor. Sorry to keep you waiting. Looks like a nice teddy bear you have there. I'm glad you brought him. Do you shake hands with people you meet? Oh, strong handshake. Who's that you got with you there? Mom, is it okay that I shake hands with her as well? Yes. Then we say hello to mom. So let's analyze what's going on here. To start, Dennis, not mom, comes first. Then we introduce ourselves. Then we apologize for waiting. But without elaborating, you hear that? I don't come in and say, oh, sorry to keep you waiting, but I have such a busy day and I am so important and I have so many patients, but now I'm here. Because who does all that explaining really help? Not Dennis, no. An apology, however, feels good. And then we had this small talk about his teddy bear. Remember that? Children be bring stuffed animals, action heroes, blankets as their allies to help them feel in control. And we acknowledge that, and we acknowledge that they're helping themselves. And here, when we doctors train for these things, we start discussing, because some of us will say, ah, small talk, that's not really my style. I'm more direct to the point. I don't do that. And I must say, it's tempting then to say, oh, so it doesn't come natural to you, talking about the stuffed animals. No, it doesn't. Well, then we have a surprise for you, because you see, this isn't about you. <laughs> this is what science say is the best way to meet patients who are in a situation they'd rather be without, get their shoulders down, feel in control. So if it doesn't come natural to you, I suggest you practice a bit. <laughs> okay. Anyway, when we get into the doctor's office, we'll start more of the medical history, saying something like this. So you've been ill now for three or four days with a fever and a cough. I'd I'll have some doctor's question, and I'd like to examine you carefully. But before we get to that, is it okay if I ask you, what do you imagine is causing you to feel ill with a fever and a cough? Now, we think it's a lung infection, mom will say. So now we know what mom thinks. <laughs> and what do you imagine? I think we doctors can blame ourselves for this need of parents to answer on behalf of their children. Because we are expert in signalizing that we want answers, correct ones, we want them now. And kids aren't really used to being asked these questions either, so parents feel the urge to help them. Only problem with that is that here, the point is not to get a correct answer, because there isn't really one. The point is to get an answer, any answer really, from the correct person. Okay, so now we know what mom thinks. And what do you imagine? What do you think kids say then? They say, I don't know. They always say, I don't know. And that's pretty strange, because you don't go around feeling ill or sick or in pain for days without any idea what might be going on in your body. 
So now, hopefully, Dennis here is starting to trust us, though. He's thinking about letting me in on his team. So I can be a bit more persistent now. Say, it's okay that you don't know. Because I don't know either yet. We'll find this out together. And that's also the reason I didn't ask you what you know. I'm just very interested in what you imagine. I'm missing a tooth. That's what he said. Perhaps it's fallen down here. <laughs> and I'm not sure what he worried him the most, having a tooth in his lungs or that he missed out of some donations from the tooth fairy. I don't know. <laughs> but I can say, oh, I'm glad you said that. That's important information you come with here. Thanks. And while we discuss this, I can mildly interrupt him saying, ah, oh, hold on a second. Do you know how hard it is what mom's doing right now? No, sitting there having lots of information and questions, worrying about her son who's ill and waiting for her turn to speak. That's pretty hard. <laughs> so I think you must have a very wise mom. So we show Dennis that his mom is competent because she's the one who'll be administrating all of this treatment once they get back home. So we want to transfer as much medical authority to the parents as possible. And then we can ask mom, and what do you think? Well, I mentioned the pneumonia, the lung infection. That's a possibility, yeah. What else have you been thinking about? Something dangerous, maybe? Dangerous, you say? Lots of people have thought about something dangerous. Yeah, like whooping cough, for example. I'm glad you said that. What else have you been worried about? Now, isn't that enough? Sooner or later, they run out of theories. In my experience, everybody has one theory. Most people have two. They have one plausible common theory and then one worst case scenario, dreadful <laughs> one, that they don't dare even say. Very few have more than three theories. That's too much to worry about. So I say, I say I'm more than enough. And it's important that we ask these questions because for once we do get a lot of biomedical information out of it, but we also get to see a bit of what's going on in people's minds, what they worry about. And that is important because the more you worry, the worse you feel and the less you heal. So now when we know this, we can help people not only with their infection, but also with their worries. And then, of course, we'll have to examine the patient at some point, because people don't come to the doctor just to be asked what they think themselves. <laughs> they like a medical opinion. So I'll put on my stethoscope and I'll listen to his heart and I'll say, oh, I can hear your heart pumping solid and clear. I think you must have a good heart. And those lungs, even with that bad cough that's been bothering you, sound strong. They're helping you get better. And after that, we'll give our conclusion. So let me see if I got this right. You've been sick for two or three days now, fever and a cough. You thought about that tooth missing, and you thought about a lung infection and uh, the whooping cough. Is that about right? And hopefully I'm about right, because I have paid attention. So now they know that we know. And now I've examined you carefully. We took some blood tests. We even took that x-ray. And you know, mom is absolutely right. This is a lung infection. That tooth is nowhere to be seen. And this isn't the kind of illness you get from whooping cough. So we can take that off the worry list. So now you can take some antibiotics to fight off the infection. And you have a decision to make. We can use liquid or tablets. What do you prefer? Liquid. Thanks, you're in charge of that. And now you can take this four times a day to help fight off the germs. You see, he's still in control. The medicine is only a helper, which is the case, by the way. And take, use it all up till there's nothing left in the bottle. And if you don't get better, I need you to call me. And I also want you to send me a message in two or three days when you're feeling better. 
here's my number, and I'll take a piece of paper, and I'll write it down, and I'll give it to the kid, because we're a team now. And then, to wrap it up, we show them we are thankful they trust us, saying something like this, thanks for letting me work with you today. Now have a safe trip home, and thank your bear for me. Okay. You haven't forgotten about that girl with the arm, have you? Because she's still waiting there. <laughs> with the helium balloons. Helium balloons, ah, nice. I like that too. It helps if you have something that you also like. And you see, here we have the best helium balloons ever. Because we have the one that the imagination creates. And you can have as many as you'd like whatever size and color you imagine them to be. How many would you like? Two, she <laughs> said. Good number. Here you have two. And don't let them float up. Keep them down. Don't relax your arm yet, because now I'll give you 10 more, all different sizes and colors, and they really want to fly away, so don't let them fly away. Keep them down. Hold your arm still. Don't relax it yet. Because you see, you're in control here. And if you want the nurses to stop, all you need to do is you let one of those balloons lift one of those fingers and we'll all pause. Try it now. Exactly, you just lift. And, and when you take it down, we can continue removing that cost. And now I'll give you 25 more balloons, fantastic colors and sizes, and, and hold them all down now because they really want to fly away. And when you're ready, you can relax your arm and let the balloons do their job and they'll lift the arm far enough so the nurses here can do their job. And then the arm will go up because you see kids are good at this. They're wired to use their imagination and their trust and their courage to help themselves. And when they need it the most, it's our job as doctors, as nurses, as parents to help them be at their best. And we do that by seeing the world through their eyes and by being curious about them. And since you now sat through this talk, you now also know this, so you'll already be better at helping the kids and yourself as well. So uh, congratulations, can I say that? <laughs> or, and thanks for listening. <laughs>